Hi, and welcome to GYC 2018. We're in Houston, live at the uh, Monday night service. And this is uh, December 31st, so happy Monday, happy December 31st. 2018 is nearly over, and it's been a wonderful year. I'm Tim Parton, General Manager of the Praise Him Music Network. This is Jill Morricone, General Manager of 3ABN, and we're excited to be here. It's been a wonderful time. And you know, Jill, I was thinking earlier about uh, it's been over 30 years since I have been young at the age of some of these uh, teenagers. You're so young. Well, but, uh, but the age of some of these teenagers. And um, now I'm kind of an old guy, and but I remember what David said, the psalmist David in, in Psalm 37, 25. I have been young, now I am old, but I have never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. And I'm just grateful as I'm looking back over 2018 and the faithfulness that God has shown to me, um, just re remarkable. And I am very grateful to him for his faithfulness. And uh, so later on tonight, we're going to be ending the evening in prayer, uh, praying out the old year, praying in the new. And you had an experience just this morning with I prayer. I love that about GYC is that time of prayer and the time in the prayer room. And I'm a shame to say for all the years I've been at GYC, it was my first time. This morning at 545 in the prayer room, hundreds of young people gathering in for that united prayer, that time of thanksgiving to God, praise and adoration and confession. It was an incredible experience. We just want to encourage you at home to spend as we enter a brand new year, spend some time with the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer. Commit your heart, as it were, to Him. And we have an incredible program tonight, don't we, Tim? Yes, we do. In fact, right now we see a big choir up on stage, so I suspect that there's going to be some wonderful singing tonight. Tell us about that. That's right. We have the GYC Choir under the direction of um, Neblet, and I just love the music that they do. And we're going to hear from Stephen Conway. He's been bringing us our nightly message every night, and we're looking forward to that message as well. So let's join the music on stage right now. Enjoy your evening. Amen. And for our last song, if you will join us in singing our theme song, This Witness I Will Bear. To the end. 
Buenas noches, GYC. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. This, is, uh, this is the Spanish part of GYC. We came here to tell you what is happening in Latin America. There are great things happening all over the world because the Holy Spirit speaks all the languages. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I have it with me here, uh, Michelle. Michelle is part of the leadership uh, team of, for Latin America affiliates, and she's going to tell us a little bit more about what's happening in Colombia. This year, we have the first GYC in Colombia. Amen? Amen. Amen. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Yes, David. So there were 70 young people who came from all over Colombia. They were studying about their purpose within the Three Angels message and how can we finish this work in our generation. So they went door to door. And they were seeking out people who want to study the word and also health needs. But out, as a result of that um, survey, they found 300 people that would like to study the Bible. Amen. Amen. So we are so happy to see the, 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 the impact that, that, that GYC is taking place in Colombia. But that's not it, right? No, because no. Because what happened at the end of the, uh, of the conference? Yeah. So at the end of that conference, there was an appeal made for those that would be willing to dedicate three months to go revive a dying church in an area where there was hardly any young people present. So you said that five people decided to go there. Five, yeah. But they needed five or they needed... No, they needed six. They needed six. Yeah. So what happened? They were searching up and down for that sixth person, could not find it. They decided, we're going to go forward. They went to this place they called the Project Mission Teo. And they go there, and they find this young person who had just recently given his life to Jesus. He saw what they were doing, and then he said, I need to join this full time. And so he joined their team as a sixth team player that they needed. Amen. So basically, a local young person saw what these five people did, it, and, and he joined them. Mm -hmm. So he was the sixth. Yes. So what was the result of, of, of the whole three months? Because they just finished, right? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, a result of just service is obviously revival. And so revival happened in that church. There were many people who decided to give their lives to Jesus. And now the union is asking these young people to continue another three months in that area to continue the work that God has started. So the union saw the work and they said three months is not enough. You need to stay another three months. Amen? Amen. So this is what young people are doing in Latin America. And also I have someone here with me. Can you tell us your name and which GYC are you representing? Uh, my name is Angelica Gonzalez, and I'm representing GYC Guatemala in Central America. Amen. So uh, GYC has, uh, this is their third year of GYC in Guatemala. So can you tell us, did GYC just pop up and, 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 
in Guatemala, how, how did it start? Well, actually, no. Uh, GYC Guatemala started here in the States three years ago in a hotel room in Louisville, Kentucky. After uh, me and two other friends attended to the GYC back in Louisville, Kentucky, and we just pray in that room and ask for the guidance of God to start our GYC in Guatemala. Amen. So you, you never know that right now in the hotel room can be starting a new GYC. Amen. So can you tell us uh, what, what has been happening in Guatemala? Uh, yes. Well, as you mentioned, uh, this was our third uh, conference. Um, and last year, um, uh, we have uh, the outreach uh, for this evangelistic uh, campaign that was going to, uh, uh, to uh, be set uh, after the Congress as a post-conference. And after that uh, post-conference, over 20 people uh, in that area decided to uh, baptize uh, uh, after this. So the, you guys did it, the, the uh, post conference, which was an evangelistic series, and after that, young people stayed and they preached, and 20, more than 20 people got baptized after that. That's right. Amen. So many of you, you have heard probably in the, um, in the news that a volcano erupted in, in Guatemala. How many of you saw that? Uh, can you tell us, did GYC uh, responded to that, or what happened? Yes, we did. Uh, actually, we partnered with ADRA uh, this year. Um, we uh, gathered some uh, food and some supplies to get to these families that basically have lost everything, their homes, their families, and all. Uh, but there was this man um, that was in one of uh, the shelters. Uh, he lost his family, he lost his home, and he was like a little bit apart from the rest of the group. So, and, wait, wait a second. Mm -hmm. He lost his home, yes. but his whole family passed away. Yes. That They died during that mm -hmm. situation. Wow. Yes, that's right. And uh, three of our uh, GYC volunteers approached this man. Um, they prayed for him. And after that, uh, he was more receptive about uh, hearing uh, more about the Bible. And uh, he also told us, like, uh, for uh, those weeks that we were visiting the shelter, we became uh, uh, his new family. So he said, I lost a family, but now you became my family. Amen. This is what GYC is taking place, is doing in, in Latin America, touching people's lives, young people doing that work. Uh, we also have a, a now uh, about Panama. Can you tell us what's happening in Panama? Yes. So, David, there's going to be hundreds of thousands of young people coming to Panama. Amen. So that's going to be the largest GYC ever, right? Not really. So it's the World Youth Conference for the Catholics. Okay, so a hundred, hundreds of thousands young people are coming to Panama for a youth conference. From all over the world. Wow, and they're Catholics. Yes. So they're going to be coming to Panama as well as the Pope, and we're going to be having GYC leaders come from all over Latin America. We're going to be training them how to share literature, and we're going to be doing a One Million Glow Challenge where we're going to be passing out glow to all of these young people that are coming, just seeking to plant gospel seeds as they are there. And, and guess what? We have developed a new glow track for that. And it's, in Spanish, it's called Bendita Entre Todas Las Mujeres, uh, Blessed Among All Women. It's about Mary, and it teaches you that uh, the authority is not in Mary, it's in the Bible, because Mary herself said, do, you know, made your will be according to your word. So that's what it's about, right? Yes, amen. So we're excited because this is the purpose of GYC, to train and to galvanize young people to finish the work. And whose generation? And our generation. And our generation. And this, a lot of leaders are going to come to Panama. They're going to be trained how to do these mission trips. And they are going to do it. And they're going to go back to their countries and do the same thing. And I, w I want to finish with, uh, with another country, which is GYC in Venezuela. Uh, the situation has been really hard that uh, as uh, from the U.S., we're not able to enter to the country because of political situations. But I will tell you this, that there are young people that are committed to the work over there. Amen. And I'll tell you a couple stories. And one will show you the commitment of these young people. We went to the border uh, between Colombia and Venezuela to meet this group of young people to give them some training. And their goal, we only ask them, just come to the border. That's all that we want. So people have to come, and they came to the border, and they, 
and they needed some money to, do tra to make the transportation from the border side to the place where we were meeting inside Colombia. One of the girls, she's a medical student, she had money only to go to the border. But she didn't have money, and her money worth nothing in Colombia. She didn't have money to move within Colombia, to go to the place where we were meeting. And she told us her story that she, nothing will stop her to get some training about GYC and the message of the Seventh-day Adventist, Adventist Church. What she did is she made in her home, before traveling, she made rice desserts. And crossing the border, she starts selling those desserts on the streets so she can have some money. And this is the very same, same girl that she saw the need because in Venezuela, right now there's so much uh, starvation that the kids, their children are passing out in the streets because they're not eating at home, they're not eating anywhere. So she saw the need and she opened a little school called Benjamin School where they're hosting young children and they're feeding them and also giving them education. And more than 90% of those children are not Adventists, and all their parents are receiving Bible studies through that. And this year, they were able to, to, uh, to open the third school in Venezuela. So we will, we will ask you for prayers in Latin America, and I hope that many young people realize that you can do a lot of things for God if you are willing. Thank you very much. Greetings, it's my pleasure to tell you about our upcoming ASI convention. I'm Pastor Philip Batiste. I'm the Departmental Director and ASI Secretary Treasurer for the North American Division. ASI is a department of the North American Division, and ASI stands for Adventist Layman Services and Industries. And ASI exists to mobilize and empower lay business people, lay ministry people, lay professionals to engage in our mission of sharing Christ in the marketplace. And this year, we have an exciting, next year actually, we have an exciting ASI convention happening July 31 to August 3rd in Louisville, Kentucky. Our theme is Business Unusual, and during that convention, we have on the Friday a very special Young Professionals event. That Young Professionals event is all day Friday, meals included, and if you register for that one day Young Professionals event, it's only $99, and we give you a complimentary registration registration to the entire four days of the rest of the ASI convention. Now, I have with me some exciting, dynamic young professionals. Uh, Mark Payton, tell us, what's the first reason why? We're going to share with you three reasons why you should register to come to the Young Professionals event. What's the first reason why? Yeah, so the first thing that we do here is networking. You know, I'm a young professional. All of us are young professionals. <clears throat> I'm a freelance filmmaker and I live on networking, you know? Being right. able to work with other people in my, in my category of work and other people with complementary skill sets is super helpful for me. So like being able to network with other people who do well at finances or marketing, that is so helpful. So that's the first thing that you'll get, networking. Now the other cool thing that I should mention though about this event is that we are some of the organizers for this and we're young people, you know? We saw yeah. a need for young people to be able to network with other young people about professional work you know we're young and we want help from others so that's another really cool thing about this event thank you Chris what's the next reason why the second reason why you're not going to want to miss the young professionals ASI event this year is because of mentorship so I personally own a digital marketing company and I know that mentorship is critical to becoming successful in any business. There are people who carve the way and find success before us that we can learn from. And there are people in the Adventist church who have found success in business and ministry that are offering this mentorship to us as young people. So some of the people that we've had in the past are Gary Rayner. Gary Rayner has invented a, a, a special phone case called a life proof case. It's a waterproof case for your iPhone. And so he's a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. He has a really big business. And so we've had people like him. We've also had people like Justin Koo, who is a famous uh, vlogger on YouTube. And so we've had people like that. We've also had people like Chef Chu, who's a world famous uh, chef who has started restaurants to reach the inner city and who has uh, a whole line of vegetarian meats. Awesome. So networking, mentoring. What's the third thing, Michelle? All right. 
The third reason is training. So this event is meant to be practical. We're going to learn things like how do we become better leaders? Maybe you're wanting to grow in your profession, in your career, and you're figuring out how to do that, but not just for the sake of climbing a ladder, but for the sake of how to spread the gospel. How do we become leaders and sharing Christ in our professions? We're going to talk about financial empowerment. A lot of people ask me as a business professor, as a young person, how do I really deal with my finances? That was feedback we got. We're going to cover that this year. We're going to talk about dealing with conflict, how to deal with conflict in the workplace. We're going to talk about how to be culturally relevant in the workplace without compromise. How do we share Christ? How do we be we be relevant in the world, yet be true to what we believe. And we're also going to talk about entrepreneurship. I know there are some here that God has given you a burden for a business or a ministry you want to start, and you're wondering how. And we're going to talk about that and give real skills at this event. Wow, Michelle, I can't wait to come to the ASI Young Professionals event next year, July 31 to August 3rd, and that one-day event is specifically August 2nd. So as people leave tonight, we're going to give them something very special in their hands. Michelle, what are we going to give them and what do they want to do with it? All right. So you're going to get a card as you go out the door. And on this card is a phone number. Please text GOASI to the phone number on this card. You'll be the first to know about early bird registration when it starts and get 50% off regular registration. So don't miss this. Make sure you get a card and text GOASI to that number today. All right, look at your neighbor and say, go ASI. God bless you, everyone. of you have the Ellen White app on your phone or your tablet? Okay, how many of you use it at least once a week, if not more? A lot of you. So imagine if you did not have access to the writings of Ellen White because it was written in a language you could not understand. This is a reality for so many of our brothers and sisters. Of the official 440 publications of Ellen White, only about a quarter of them have been translated into Spanish for the Ellen White Library. German and French have been translated into about 15% and 12% respectively. And many languages have been translated in less than 1%. As Adventists, we believe that Ellen White's writings speak with prophetic authority and provide guidance, instruction, and correction for our church. But there are so many who do not have the writings of Ellen White available to them. They're left in the dark. But translating is no easy task. If we go about it by traditional means, just for one of the major languages, it would be millions of dollars invested and countless hours. More than 100 years have passed and the job hasn't been completed, which is why we need a new approach, something faster, something less expensive. What if all bilingual or multilingual Seventh-day Adventists from every country in the world came together to translate the writings of Ellen White into their native language? Well, the General Conference and the White Estate liked this idea and have decided to fund it. And that is how Ellen for All began. 
But how can we change these statistics? How can we find more of Ellen White's writings in other languages? Well, think Wikipedia, the world's youngest, largest, and most quoted encyclopedia in the world. This innovative, open source approach is growing exponentially in content and reach at a fraction of the cost. And Ellen for All provides a similarly collaborative platform. Any given church member who speaks another language can translate a text while more experienced translators can edit that text. And once a final version has been produced, there are a few trusted proofreaders who will check that over in that language. Once it's been approved by a white estate representative, it's published on the LNG White apps and websites. In other words, it's a global community of Adventist volunteers who are translating, editing, and regulating the translations of Ellen White's writings, which means we have an improved translation and less time and less cost, providing Ellen White's writings for free digitally. GYC, we are this global community. We saw on outreach how many people speak different languages. Well, currently Ellen for All is beta testing, is in the beta testing phase for German and Swahili. But soon the translation of 12 main books will be opening in 55 languages, which is part of a general conference initiative. 256 translators are on the platform now, and they have spent over 750 hours translating. So with the help of GYC and other organizations, our hope is to grow that to thousands of translators from around the world and to have these books translated by GC Session in 2020. We invite everyone who loves the spirit of prophecy and who wants to help translate it into their native language to join this movement. And if you don't speak another language, you probably know somebody who does. So we encourage you to share this. Be a part of something bigger something of eternal value. If you have any questions, you're welcome to stop by the Outpost Center's international booth, number 404. And we also encourage you to check out ellenforall.org and start translating. Thank you. On Friday and Sabbath, Jonathan and I stood here and talk to you about our vision for GYC and for you as GYC, for GYC beyond, going beyond just a conference, for going to the world, for sharing the gospel with others. We talk to you about our idea for Iceland, to go to this place where we have such a small Christian presence and to share with them just one simple thing. We decided that we are going to go there and we're going to pray for every single person we can find. We're going to walk around the cities, we're going to walk around that island, and we're going to pray and we're going to wait and we're going to see what God is going to do. Jonathan will tell you a little bit more about that in just a moment, but before we do that, while we wait for him to get here, take a look at the short video. All right, everybody, are you ready to go to the end? Jonathan, can you hear me? I can hear you, Eric, loud and clear. Can you hear me? Where are you right now? Greetings, GYC, from Iceland. I'm freezing out here in the middle of Reykjavik. Behind me is the polar night, and it's dark. And it keeps Iceland dark throughout the winter. And it reminds me about how sin 
keeps this world in the darkness. God has called us to light up this world. As you can probably hear behind me, there's still fireworks going on, welcoming the new year. But we are looking for more than temporary light. We are looking for God's light, for Jesus to come back. We want to welcome him, and we want his glory to be seen in this world. Jesus told us to go into all the world and to share the gospel. He gave us the Holy Spirit, and he will empower us to go to the end because he promised to be with us to the end. In 2019, and I'm already in 2019 over here, we will go to Iceland, as Eric has shared. I'm here, and so we're going to start right now as I go to the first door. Join me. GYC, may today mark the beginning of a movement of people who are sold out to Christ, ready to go to the end for Christ in this generation, to see Him come soon. If you are interested in signing up for this and for going to the end as well, we challenge you to commit to at least sign up for more information as it comes out, you can go to gycweb.org slash Iceland. You can open the Attendify app and click on the Iceland link, or you can text in at the number 610, text GYC. You see it on the screen right there, and you can say, if you're committing to go, if you've made up your mind and you're ready to go, you can say, I will go, and then we'll get that. But even if you aren't able to go, even if you can't join us in Iceland and fly all that far distance just to pray for people and to do something radical for Christ, your mission starts here. Your mission starts now to go to the end for Christ right now. Go beyond GYC. Good evening, GYC. So we will be having our second and last offering for the convention. And to put on a convention like GYC, it costs quite a bit. And actually, we are, I was asked to let you guys know that we are actually $12,000 short of our budget. And for example, to put this into perspective, to go on outreach when we rent the buses, it costs about $50 per row, so about $50 per two people that go on outreach. So um, I'm sharing this with you so you're all aware what it takes and what our need is and how much we depend on your donations to make this possible. I mean, I get a blessing when I come to GYC, and if we want to be able to rent a space like this where thousands of us can be under one roof, encouraging one another, inspiring one another, being able to go back to making connections with people and going home and knowing we have friends that have the same mission, um, we, are, we need your support. So that's the assistant treasurer side of things. But the more personal Madison side of things I'd like to share with you is about a lesson that I learned a few years ago. So I like to say that Jesus has my heart. But I know that sometimes there are pieces of it that I take back and that aren't his. So a few years ago, coming back from a summer mission trip, me and my two friends, all our luggage was stolen. Our big suitcases, our little suitcases, our backpacks, our clothing, our Bibles, personal notes from friends, and my brand new laptop. So right when it happened, it was kind of a shock. And if you've ever had anything stolen before, it doesn't, it feels surreal. It was interesting going to the airport and only having your wallet. It's kind of fun to not have to be responsible for your luggage. But that evening when I boarded my plane for a five hour trip home by myself, I was tired, exhausted, a little bit cranky. And I started to think about every single thing that I had lost that was stolen. How much it cost, how much I liked it, and how I would be starting college in a couple weeks and I needed a laptop. I needed a laptop. So when I got home, the next weekend my family and I, we went to a camp meeting and they had an appeal. And I sat there with $50 in my back pocket. And I thought, 
I really need this. I have to get a new laptop. I need to replace some of my items. I need, I need, I need. And it was a little bit of a war in my heart with me and God. And then I realized that I learned that lesson right then in my life that money comes and money goes. Possessions come and possessions go. But God, God is always there for me forever. And I want to invest in God. So I'm sharing this with you because I want to make an appeal to you today. I was going to say that after the convention, but to spend some time, but I would like you to spend time this evening to ask God what parts of your heart are not his yet to actually make God the center of your life. This is an appeal to me as well. I'm not trying to twist your arm, but we will be picking offering up tonight, and if you decide to donate, I won't be disappointed. But I will be much more happy knowing that a few thousand young people spent time looking at their heart and giving what they are still holding on to back to the Lord so he can have all of it. So that's my short sermon. Now, if you would like to donate this evening, I have seven ways you can donate. So you can pick the one that you think is the most fun for you. So one, you can drop money into the buckets that will be passed around. Two, you can put money into the envelope that was left on your seat. Three, you can fill out your credit card information on this envelope. Number four, you can use the QR code. Number five, you can go to our website gycweb.org to donate. Also, you guys have the new app, the Tendify app. You can go on there and press to donate as well. And the seventh way is you can text go give to 313131. Before the ushers come to collect the offering, please bow your heads as I pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for GYC. Thank you for the young people that are here. Lord, please help, please show us what is in our hearts that we haven't given over to you yet, that you can be the center of our lives. Please help us to make investments in you because you are always there for us and we would like to serve you in return. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you. 
to the end. Friends, I cannot believe this is the last night. I don't want it to end, <laughs> don't you? And uh, is it such a, when, when we started GYC this year, we started on a high note. We started on a Sabbath. And now when we end GYC, we end on a new year. And tonight, we'll be welcoming New Year in a very special way. So there is a very special prayer session at 10.30 to 12.30 in the morning. Not in the, our ballroom, but in the Marriott. Marriott second floor, Houston ballroom. Again, tonight, 10.30 to 12.30 in the morning, there will be a prayer session in the Marriott. Second floor, Houston Ballroom. And tomorrow morning will be our last United Prayer Session. And friends, for those of you who have not visited the prayer room, this is your last chance. Amen? Amen. You look all so tired. This is our last stretch. Let's all make it to the end. Amen? Amen. And I remember, one by one, I just... I just received testimonies after testimonies, people approaching me along the way. Brother Jem, I did not plan to come on the second day because I'm, I'm thinking no one could understand me because I speak Spanish. And this lady fell asleep and he said, I don't want to wake up. My friend, my friend might wake up, but I will not wake up. And friends, you know what? Early morning, she was awakened by the sound of her friend getting up and doing a lot of things, and there was an alarm, and said, okay, I'll get up. And she knocked on her friend's door, said, you woke me up. And when she opened the door, her friend was still sleeping. The Lord is the one who woke her up. And she came back to the prayer room and said, Brother Jem, that was the best experience. I'm coming back on another day. And she has been there in the prayer room day after day after day, one miracle after another, friends. And we would like to invite you to visit the prayer room because it is not just that we want to, to the, the prayer room to be filled up. We want you to experience what we have experienced. We want you to see what we have seen. So friends, do not miss out on this last opportunity to spend time in the presence of God. And I love this very beautiful quote that says, it would be well for us to spend at least a thoughtful hour each day contemplating on the life of Christ. And if we do so, it says here, our love, our confidence in Him will be more constant and our love will be quickened. My dear friends, this is the only way to last till the end, is to fall in love constantly with our Savior day after day after day. With this being said, I'd like to request the congregation to be on their knees as we spend this short moment in prayer. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear, make me a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Oh, dear Father, we love you, O oh Lord. And dear God, we pray that as we continue to spend each and every waking hours of the day with you. May you draw us closer and closer and closer to your heart, O oh Lord. May what we have learned in this conference will never stay here in Texas. Please, Lord, help us to bring it back to our homes. Bring it back to our churches. Let the fire go on until the end, O oh Lord. Amen. Dear Father, may our lives be fully surrendered to you. Amen. Teach us, Lord, to lay it all on the altar. And help us, Lord, to be inspired of the sacrifice that you have done for us. Help us, Lord, to sacrifice everything for you because it is a joy to sacrifice for our Master. And Lord, as we spend these 15 seconds of silence, may you speak to our hearts, O Lord.
Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and so free. Thank you, dear Father, for giving us Jesus. And Lord, for giving you our hearts. This Lord, we pray in the loving name of your Son, Jesus, all your children say, Amen. Good evening, everyone. I want to begin this evening by making a correction on last night I told you about uh, the author of Man's Search for Meaning and I mentioned the name Victor Hugo. I don't really know who Victor Hugo is, but I meant to say Victor Frankel. But if you find out about Victor Hugo, you can let me know about him too. <clears throat> Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11, page 105, talking about persecution that is arising and the, the danger that was approaching the church. There was danger that the disciples would linger there in Jerusalem too long. Not, not just persecution, but also success. Unmindful of the Savior's commission to go to all the world, are you awake tonight? Listen to this. Forgetting that strength to resist evil is best gained by aggressive service. I heard one amen. Forgetting that strength to resist evil is best gained by aggressive service, they began to think that they had no work so important as that of shielding the church in Jerusalem from the attacks of the enemy. Got another gem here. This gem, one of the brethren shared with me. Christ Object Lesson page 384, the completeness of Christian character. <laughs> Help us, Holy Ghost. The completeness of Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within. Man, did you hear that? The completeness of Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within when the sunshine of heaven fills the heart and is revealed in the countenance. Lord, have mercy. <clears throat> so I'm not crazy after all. This seemingly strange concept that the things that God wants us to achieve, and in fact, God has purposed that we would attain and achieve, are not always necessarily gained by continuously focusing on those things. Jesus taught, I believe, and lived this principle. In Matthew chapter 23, verses 11 and 12, the Bible says, But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, 
and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. That's backwards, isn't it? No one thinks that the way to the top is by going down. You didn't get on the elevator if you stayed in one of the hotels around here and you stayed on the 15th, 18th, 19th, 20th floor and said, well, let me go down to the first floor. You expect it to go up in order to get up. But in the kingdom of God, Jesus says, if you want to be great, you must be a servant, a slave. This concept huh, is expressed not only in the words of Christ, but all through Scripture. One more time, Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Jesus always agrees with Scripture, or Scripture always agrees with Jesus, either way you look at it. In the 21st chapter of Numbers, you remember the story. The Israelites began to complain about God's guidance. He was taking too long to get them to their destination, or so they believed, and they began to murmur and complain about God's guidance and His goodness. And so God says, okay, you want to see what it's like without me? And so He removes the protective covering that rested over the children of Israel and danger that existed but had been kept at bay by unseen forces was at once allowed to come into the camp. Fiery serpents begin to bite the individuals there in the camp, and the solution seemed to be completely illogical. Moses, get a, uh, an enormous pole and make a serpent out of brass and put that serpent on the pole and then allow the word to go out through the, through the camp that whoever looks will live. Now, if you sit here tonight and say that that was reasonable and logical, I know you're lying. Let some snakes up in here tonight. And nobody will be concerned with the message. Everybody will be concerned with getting up out of here as quickly as you possibly can. And if a snake is hanging on your leg, your attention will be fixed on that serpent and trying to relieve yourself. Is that true, yes or no? And yet God asked the children of Israel to do something that was completely illogical. Listen to me tonight, my friends. Stop looking at what is attacking you, what is hurting you, what is perhaps going to take your life. Stop looking at that which is, which is killing you and instead look and live at this serpent on the pole. Many of us are like, I, I've got to believe some of the children of Israel were, you got to be out of your mind. I'm looking for where the serpents are. If I can just stop these snakes from biting me, my life will be all right. If I can just put down the pornography, everything will be all right. If I can just leave the alcohol alone, everything will be fine. If I can just get this better job, everything will, will, will flow in the proper direction. If I can just get this sin out of my life, then everything will be all right. But Jesus says, stop fixating on your problem and start fixating on me. Joshua, 
and the children of Israel have entered into the promised land and the fortress city of Jericho is there. And the Bible tells the story, you remember it, that Joshua gets a group of soldiers together and they go up to the wall and they measure the length, the width, the breadth of the wall and, and they get some mathematicians together and they begin to calculate uh, just at what points they can, they can apply pressure so that they will be able to break through. You remember that story, right? You're like, no, we ain't never heard that one. That's because that's not how it went, beloved. God said, I want you to march around the city. <laughs> Woo! I want you to march around the city. You want me to do what? March around the city. But Lord, we're going to be sitting ducks. <laughs> we're going to be bait target practice. God says, don't worry, just do what I'm asking you to do. But how is this helping us towards our end and our desired goal? It, it doesn't make sense just do what I'm asking you to do day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven. And you remember the, the song that all the, of the little children sing, the walls came what? They came tumbling down, not because Israel focused on the wall, because Israel did what God asked, as improbable as it seemed. The story of Jehoshaphat and the innumerable foes that he was facing, Israel at the Red Sea, Gideon with 300 men, over and over again, these stories are trying to impress a most powerful lesson upon our hearts and upon our minds, beloved, and the lesson is that the way to accomplish that which we desire is not always going to be the way that we think. Just think about the disciples. Acts chapter 1, are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus, you're going to set up an earthly kingdom beside the fact that that was twisted theology. Jesus said, I am going to set up an everlasting kingdom. And you know how I'm going to do it? They said, yes, yes, tell us, Jesus. I'm going to go to the cross and die. Judas probably voiced what everyone was thinking. You must be out of your mind. How on earth can going to the cross establish an everlasting kingdom. Someone may be asking themselves tonight, well, okay, Conway, I'm listening to you. I'm listening. I'm looking at you cross-eyed and I don't know, but tell me. If I'm not supposed to focus on my problems and if I'm not supposed to focus and be consumed with my problems and my desires or even my destination, then what, pray tell, am I to focus on? First Kings chapter 3, the Bible says in First Kings chapter 3, verse 5, in Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask what I shall give thee. Oh, don't you like that? How many of you would like God to come and say that to you? Ask what it is that I shall give thee. Verse 6, and Solomon said, thou hast showed unto thy servant David my father great mercy according as he has walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him, a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. I want to paint the picture for you a little bit. 
Solomon was a king. He was a what? He was a king. Now, who was the first king of Israel? Saul. And how did that work out for him? Very shortly after Saul was anointed, perhaps just a few years, Saul proved that he was unworthy to be king, and David was anointed as king. My suspicion is that the word got out somehow that God's hand was on David. And even if no one said anything, it was evident to everyone, including Saul, that God's hand was on David for a unique and special work. That work would be to replace him one day as king. David becomes king. And David's, David's reign endured a coup. David's kingdom was stolen from him at the hands of his own son, Absalom. Murder and intrigue, Saul's attempted murders of David, Absalom's attempted murder of David, Absalom's murder of his oldest brother who stood in line to the throne. Solomon, even before he was anointed, had his older brother to proclaim himself king before David, persuaded, urged by Bathsheba and Nathan, that something strange was going on in the nation, David rushes and places Solomon on the throne and has him anointed and declared to be king. All of this, beloved, simply to say that Solomon's throne was not secure, humanly speaking. Are you with me tonight? His throne was most certainly not secure, and so it would have been a reasonable request for Solomon to say, establish my throne. Based on what had happened to his father and based on what had happened to Saul before him, it would have been a logical request. Lord, I want to do your will, and I understand what you have prophesied, but I can only walk in your will if you establish and secure my throne. But beloved, tonight that's not what Solomon asked. Verse 7, Now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in, and thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Verse 9, give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great a people? Verse 10, and the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked him this thing. And God said unto him, verse 11, because thou hast asked this thing and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor has asked the life of thine enemies, but has asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, verse 12, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. Friends, I like to refer to this as the Solomon principle. The what? The Solomon principle. Solomon asked God for something 
that would benefit others when it would have been reasonable for him to ask God for something that would purely benefit himself. Solomon's request pleased God because at the heart of Solomon's request were the people of God. And the Bible says that the thing pleased the Lord. Oh, tonight, would that our prayers would please God. Would that God would have a smile on his face when he listens to our prayers. How do your prayers sound? Think about it. How do they sound? I'm going to suggest something to you, but I want to help you to understand what I'm going to suggest. The Bible tells us, Jesus says, that we should ask. We should do what? We should ask. When we have a request, we should ask. So I'm not saying don't ask God. But what I'm suggesting tonight is that after you have asked God, you trust that he will do what he has promised that he would do for you. And I am challenging you tonight to turn the focus of your prayers off of yourself. There are parents who are praying for their children. God has heard your prayer. Please him by praying for someone else's children. There are some who are praying for their marriages, God has heard your prayer. Please him by praying for someone else's marriage. I want you to think about this and consider this, dear brothers and sisters. What if the key to God opening heaven's windows was if we were to pray as fervently and earnestly for others as we have prayed for ourselves. What if I'm praying for someone else's, listen to me, what if I'm praying for someone else's victory as passionately as I have prayed for my own? Are you with me tonight? What if I place my desire in the hands of God and then say, Lord, give me that which will benefit others. Or better yet, Lord, give Bob that which I have requested for myself. Lord, I know that I'm praying and I'm asking that you would work my job situation out, but work Jack's job situation out as well, Father. Lord, I know that I'm praying that you would, you would recover and you would heal me, but Father, I'm also praying that you would heal Brother Jerry. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Verse 4, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Praying, beloved, for the good of others becomes key to our good. Seeking victory for others becomes the key to our victory. In fact, I believe that in Scripture, Jesus demonstrated this principle, not just in Scripture, but even beyond in the great controversy. Listen to me. God's method of securing his throne was to step out of his throne. Didn't make sense. 
seeking the good of humanity was the way that God established before the entire universe that he is worthy. I said it the other night, when we are concerned for the welfare of others, that's, I believe, when we are most like Jesus. How can we have this experience? Number one, know your limitations. What's number one? In 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 9, Solomon says, Who is able to judge this, thy so great a people? In other words, friends, Solomon acknowledges that the task that lays before him, he, in his own strength, is unable to perform. Are you with me tonight? We must acknowledge our own limitations. We must know our limitations because when we are aware, when we acknowledge, when we know our limitations, then, beloved, we can lean on the hand of Almighty God. We can depend on Him to do what only divinity can do. I've got to say this because I know in this movement, we don't talk about failure. We don't talk about, and I was at the first GYC, Pine Springs Ranch, California. We don't talk about the people who were there who are not even in the church anymore. We don't talk about the leaders who have fallen. Don't even say their names. Because we want to disassociate ourselves from that failure. That's not what we're about. We're about victory. But failure is real. It's real. And knowing our limitations, knowing our limitations is not a bad thing. We always talk about being able to accomplish that which is impossible, and that's good, and I believe that, but we also ought to know that we are erring mortal human beings and we need the power of Almighty God, for with God all things are possible. Beloved, Jesus did not say, when he was preaching, remember Lot's wife because he didn't love her. He didn't say remember Lot's wife because he wanted her to become, uh, or the people's minds to become fixated on her. He said remember Lot's wife as a warning. Her eyes were fixed on the wrong thing. Learn from her mistake. Some of us are here tonight, and you're uncomfortable. Nobody knows you're uncomfortable, but you do. You're uncomfortable because you have a persona, and everybody sees you, and everybody thinks a certain way about you, and your greatest fear is that you would lose that. What happens if people know my weaknesses? What happens if no, I'm not the person I project myself to be. Will they still love me? And I've got to say tonight, beloved, that the way we have treated those who have fallen says no. And so we've got young people who crave authenticity, who are playing roles because you're afraid that you will lose your community. Afraid that people will turn their backs on you. Your phone won't ring anymore. You won't be asked to volunteer at GYC or serve in a position anymore. 
Something is wrong with that. We need to be a people who understand our limitations, not so that we can glory in our weaknesses, but rather that we may glory in the power of Christ who is able to deliver us from our weaknesses. If you need me, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an accountability partner for some, for some brethren who said, listen, I need you, pastor. How do you need me? I've been wrestling with this thing called pornography, and I'm going to, I'm going to link all of my, my, my electronic devices, my, my computer at home, my laptop, my phone, I'm going to link them up to a service, and every week it's going to print out in your email, and it'll tell you what I've been doing because I understand my limitations. I understand my weakness, and I need divine power, but I also need to know that there's someone who loves me in spite of my weakness. Not just the God who I cannot see, but a brother or a sister who I can. Beloved, we must know our limitations. Number two, we must target the invisible. We must do what? Solomon's prayer, my friends, dealt with his heart. It dealt with his what? I want you to think with me tonight. When you pray, are your prayers focused on your heart or are your prayers focused on what issues out of your heart? There is a difference. We can pray and say, Lord, help me not to be short with my children. Lord, help me to speak kind words to my spouse. Lord, help me to be patient. I want to suggest to you tonight that our prayers must mature beyond that. What do I mean? We must learn to pray towards the invisible. Lord, fix my heart. My impatience is a symptom of the brokenness of my heart. Lord, I'm speaking unkind words because there is unkindness in my heart. Fix my heart, Lord. Transform me, change me at the heart level. And when our prayers focus on the invisible, we, we, we graduate beyond praying about our behaviors to praying about what flows or, or what, uh, we, we, we graduate to praying about uh, the, the very source from which all of the issues of life flow. Beloved, I hope you understand the difference between those prayers. And I believe tonight that it is in service that God reveals to us that we need heart-level transformation, not merely an adjustment in behavior. You know, patchwork religion. Beginning by changing this or that habit, but all the while beginning in the wrong place, what we need is a radical transformation of heart. And here's what I've got to say, beloved. There are two ways that we come to this experience. One of them is through our failures, where God reveals our brokenness because He reveals and exposes our weaknesses. Number two is through looking into the face of Jesus. The more we look at Jesus, the more undone we see ourselves as being. The more unlike Him, the closer we come to Jesus, the more unchristlike in our own eyes we become and we fall down and say, Lord, help me. And the work that God wants to do is at the heart level. Are you listening to me tonight? I'm going to ask my 
musicians to come on out. One night, I like to try my hand at uh, cooking. My family says I'm the best cook in the family. I like that. And I like to exercise that every now and then. And so sometimes as the day is going on and I'm, I'm in the office, I'm visiting, I'm doing whatever, uh, responsibilities fall for that day and I get an idea in my mind, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a special recipe for the family, something we've never had before. We like to try new things. And so I'll find out where I'm going to pick up all of my necessities in order to, to make this particular recipe, and, 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 and I'll drive to a particular uh, grocery store that, that has these particular ingredients. You know, you can't just go to Walmart for everything. You got to go to some specialty stores. And so, so I'll, I'll find myself in these grocery stores, and I'm picking up all of these, these unique and and special ingredients, and as I'm gathering them together, all the while I'm thinking this is going to be great. When I'm cooking this up, no matter where my family is in the house, they're going to smell it. They're all going to come down. They're going to say, Dad, what is that? My daughter Abigail is going to come and take the lid off and smell. Ooh, Dad, that smells good. What did you put in it? Then we're all going to sit down around the dinner table, and I'm going to, you know, it's not just the meal, it's the presentation, right? So I'm going to plate everything just nice, and we're all going to sit down around the table, and as we are seated there around the table, they will take bite after bite, and everybody's going to say, Mmm, Dad, this is so good. Oh, you are such a wonderful cook. And my wife is going to say, Thank you, honey. I really had a long day. I'm just so glad that you came home and you prepared dinner for everyone. Thank you so very much. And I'm going to smile and I'm going to say yes. Ding. I pull up into the driveway. It's dark now. The, the lights are on and I'm still rolling this picture around in my mind and I get out of the car and I grab the grocery bags and I come to the door. I put the key in the, in the doorknob. I turn it. I open the door. I come in and my children are hanging on the walls. There is peanut butter and jelly sandwich crust on the floor that I have to step over just to make it inside of the house. Dishes are piled up on the table. Dishes are piled up in the sink. There's stuff from yesterday that's on the stove, and I'm wondering what on earth is going on. Sounds like a zoo. Feels like a zoo. Where is your mom at? Well, mom is upstairs. She's been upstairs for a while. Have you guys eaten? Yeah, we had peanut butter. Peanut butter and jelly? I had some gourmet level stuff for you. And you have peanut butter and jelly? I'm upset. The Spirit of God says, calm down. Have prayer with the children because it's late. Make sure they brush their teeth. Make sure they lay down in their beds. Then come downstairs and clean. Pick up the peanut butter and jelly crust. Wash the dishes. And I begin to do this. The kitchen is sparkling clean and the, ho the house is clean and the groceries are seated there or are or, or, or sitting there on the table and I sit down and I take a breath after I've finished everything. Oh, I'm exhausted. This night did not go like I planned. My wife comes down, and now I got to look really tired. <sighs> Pull out a chair, throw up a leg. Oh, oh honey, thank you. For, I'm a, oh, that was a long day. 
I want some sympathy now. But all the while I'm upset because this didn't quite go the way I planned. And, and my wife begins to say, honey, I was just on the phone with so-and-so, someone that our family has been ministering to, that we've been working with. I was on the phone for the last two and a half hours ministering to them in a time of crisis and my balloon is deflated. I felt bad. I was, I was disturbed. But when I find out that my wife was in ministry, I am deflated. You had no right to feel and think the way that you did. And then I'm wrestling with God. What is it that's, that's taking place here? What's this feeling that I'm experiencing deep down in my heart? And God says, Stephen, you wanted to be treated like a king tonight, but I wanted your wife and your family to be treated like royalty tonight. You wanted to be served by your family telling you how wonderful of a chef you are and how thankful for you they are, but I needed you to serve your wife tonight. And I say, Lord, am I that selfish? And God says, yes, you are. But Lord, it wasn't a bad thing to want the family to sit around the table and have dinner. No, no, no. I'm not saying it was a bad thing. But Stephen, in order for me to reveal what's lurking in the depths of your heart, I had to use this experience to show you yourself. It was only through performing these acts of service that I could reveal to you what was lacking in your life so that you would turn to me and say, Father, take it out of me. Get out of me. Beloved, this type of service that reaches the heart is what each and every one of us needs so that we can hear the voice of God speaking to us. Not about merely changing behaviors but about radically transforming our hearts. And then we can surrender as we never have before. We can pray as we never have before. And when we pray, we can trust that God will do for us what we could never do for ourselves because without him, we would not have even known ourselves. I'm going to ask the St. Martins to sing a song and then I'm going to make a very specific appeal. Please listen to the words of this song.
How many of you want to hear the words, well done? Oh, I do. I do. We cannot reach the ends of the earth until we have first reached the end of ourselves. And I am so glad tonight that there is a Savior who is gracious and patient enough to work with us and gives us a path to try. They're going to put something up on the screen tonight. Tonight's appeal is very specific. It's for those who want to give a year of service. I'm not saying it has to be 2019. I, I don't know when the Lord will prompt you, but if tonight you feel, Lord, I need to experience this radical heart transformation 
And I need to experience victory in my life the way that I never have through aggressive service. Lord, I'm willing to set aside the things that I've set are priorities, perhaps, and I want to give myself to this one year. The General Conference has a program called One Year in Missions, and I'm excited to say that here in North American Division, there are several unions that have adopted this, and the conferences in those unions, by God's grace, are adopting this. But if you are interested, tonight, <laughs> We normally don't say, pull out your cell phones. We tell you, turn them off and put them away. But what we want you to do, because we want to be sure that we can chronicle your commitment. Yes, the angels in heaven will, but we want to be able to encourage you. If God is calling you to give one year in missions, one year towards aggressive service, and I'm going to make this appeal too. We need missionaries to go overseas, the 1040 window, yes, all of that. But we also need urban missionaries. We need those who are willing to sacrifice and go into the inner cities. Do you know that there are children starving in the inner cities? One year. One year to experience God in ways that you never have one year to completely lay it all on the line for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to ask you if that's your heart's desire, aggressive service so that I can experience the loving, uh, the loving Lord Jesus as I never have and so that I can have things exposed in my life that I would never have exposed without this type of service. Now I want to ask you to come down front. One year, just one, to serve the Lord, dedicate yourself completely to Him. For some, it may be overseas. For others, it'll be right here in the urban jungles of North America where men and women, boys and girls, are dying every day without knowing this precious message that the loving Jesus Christ has given to us. I just spoke with my brother the other day, and he told me that 25 people here in America, 25 people are dying because of opioid overdoses, 25 a day. That's one person every hour who's dropping dead because of addiction. Can God count on an army of young people here at GYC? Can God count on some people who say, Lord, I'm willing to give one year, one year, You've been focused on your studies. You've been focused on climbing the ladder in terms, of, in terms of your job. And you've been focused on doing a whole lot of things. But perhaps the way to fulfillment and perhaps the way to experiencing life the way God intended you to experience it is not in those endeavors alone, but it's in radical and aggressive service for the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can experience purpose and fulfillment by giving yourself away. That's that's what Jesus meant when he said that the one who loses his life for my sake will find it. One year. One year. I've talked to young people who have already made decisions like this. Their parents did not understand. In fact, their parents thought that they were crazy. But you know what? God provides. God takes care of the things that you cannot take care of and I cannot take care of in our own strength. God steps in and he does what we can't, can't do on our own. And what God does is he convinces those so that they take note that we have been with Jesus. They understand that we're not out of our minds, but in fact, we have for the first point in our lives entered into our right minds because we are giving ourselves to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords. One year. 
one year. In the Bible, there's a principle that where God asks for a part that symbolizes the whole one year. Just a small portion, but it symbolizes so much more. It symbolizes, Lord, I'm willing to lay self aside. And I'm willing to put you first in my life. One year. One year. If the Spirit of the Lord is calling you, then come and join us here down front. One year. Just one. Jesus has given so much for us, beloved. And he continues to give. What would keep you from giving just one year? Every head is bowed and every eye is closed, loving Father and our God. You and you alone know our hearts. You know our hearts and you know the work that needs to be done on the heart level for each and every one of us that, that's in this place tonight. You also have a purpose and a plan for each and every one of our lives, but if we neglect to pick up the blood-stained banner of Prince Emmanuel, if we neglect to enter into this type of service, then Father, it's possible for us to live without having ever really lived. It's possible for us to exist here on this earth with, without ever discovering our purpose. Lord, tonight, our prayer is that you would reveal these things to us as we yield ourselves to you. Just as surely as there is a place in heaven for each and every one of us, we are told that there is a place here on this earth in your vineyard where we can labor for you. I pray that you would take the decisions of those who are standing here and the decisions of those who have texted tonight, and I pray that you would seal those decisions, Father. I pray that you would even now prepare the places where each one of us will go, prepare the souls that each and every one of us will reach. Thank you for your grace. And it's our prayer that when you look at us tonight, you will be pleased as you were when you looked at Solomon. That you will give us, because we have a heart for others, all that we could have asked for. Thank you, dear Lord, for hearing and answering this humble request. For we ask all of these things in the precious name of of Jesus. Let all of God's people say, Amen. And amen.